A major counter-terror operation is underway in Samaria. The IDF said forces are operating in the northern Samaria cities of Jenin and Tulkarm. IDF activity was also reported in Nablus as well as Palestinian Arab villages in the Jordan Valley. Military sources say the large-scale counter-terror operation is expected to last several days. The operation is currently focused on the Tulkarm and Jenin areas, with at least 10 Palestinians who have been reported killed so far in clashes and IDF drone strikes, with an additional 15 injured. The army says several wanted terrorists have been detained so far and more arrests are expected. The operation began yesterday when the IDF eliminated five terrorists in a drone strike in Nur Shams, hitting the terrorists' operation room. The operation involves Israel Border Police, the Israel Security Services and hundreds of IDF troops, along with extensive air support. The operation was triggered by the attempted suicide bombing in Tel Aviv on August 18th. The IDF believes a terror network directed the intended attack from the Tulkarm area. The bomber was named by Hamas as Jafar Mona from Nablus. He was killed when a bomb in his backpack exploded prematurely as he walked down a Tel Aviv sidewalk. One passerby was injured. In Jenin, three Palestinian terrorists were eliminated in an airstrike who were posing a threat to troops on the ground who made arrests and confiscated weapons. Explosives planted under roads were also disarmed by the IDF. Further south, another airstrike eliminated an additional four armed terrorists. As the IDF carries out one of the largest counter-terror operations in months in the West Bank, joining us to discuss the situation is Yishai Fleischer. Yishai, thanks so much for joining us today. I'd like to start by getting your take on this unusual level of activity in Tulkarm and Janine by the IDF. Is this something that you've been expecting? And what has the situation been like in Judea and Samaria with the war thus far? Well, it really depends on which parts. In Samaria, it's been more troublesome. In Judea, where I'm at, in Hebron and uh, Gush Etzion, a little bit quieter. Uh, but look, we have a we have a multi-front war right now, uh, which is in Gaza, in the north. But there's no question that jihadist elements are getting heated up, uh, and they 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 are preparing to attack one way or another. And we saw some of the funerals. Uh, that took place yesterday. And the funerals, you could see there's a lot of armed young men. Uh, there's a lot of calls for jihad and readiness for death and that kind of thing. And the IDF wants to stop uh, this phenomenon from spreading. Uh, and we don't want it to open up as a major front. So therefore, the IDF is probably uh, going into a mode of striking hard now so that it does not become a full-fledged front in the near future. Have there been efforts to push that direction in terms of having more Israeli governance over certain areas where we see the promotion and encouragement of terrorism in certain communities, in certain uh, Palestinian Arab communities on the ground there? Or is that something that's further in the future, as you mentioned? Well, on the one hand, there is the process of what we call resettling this land. And that means having normative Jewish communities settle in the uh, heartland of the Holy Land, which is Judea and Samaria. Uh, and in the places where, where I am right now, in Hebron or in Kiryat Arba or in Gush Etzion, there's a much more decent life for Jews and Arabs because there's more Israeli military presence. Don't forget the jihadists uh, attack um, Arabs first, right? Any Arabs that want to normalize uh, 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 with Israel, they're the ones that are attacked by the jihad. So the more Jewish presence we find there, the better. At the same time, I must say that this right-wing government that uh, in its heart wants to start to roll back the Oslo paradigm, the two-state paradigm, has not done so yet effectively. Uh, I'll give you just one example of an effort. Uh, there's an area next to the desert of Tkoa, uh, and that area was supposed to be a jointly uh, protected nature reserve, but it was immediately taken over by the PA and they started constructing upon it and, and getting rid of and undermining all the, the agreements that they had about keeping this special place as a nature reserve. Well, the Israeli army with the Israeli government is now pushing back in there with the civil administration to retake that area and to, and to, and to create it for what it was supposed to be, which is a nature reserve. But the bottom line is where there's an absence of an Israeli government, 
uh, jihadism takes its place. As everybody likes to say around here, there is no vacuum in the Middle East. You know, there have been reports of an increase in Iranian, actually, immigrants to Palestinian cities via Jordan, likely prompting some of this counter-terror activity, in addition to a rise in terrorism of unaffiliated uh, terrorists with specific organizations. What have you heard about this, and how can Israel best combat it, some of which I think you alluded to in the last question? Sad to say, but October the 7th was a great victory for Hamas, at least till now. Uh, and when, I'm, what I, when I said that, what I meant is, in the eyes of young Arabs, uh, so-called Palestinians. And so, therefore, uh, Iranian-style jihadism, which is what Hamas is, what Hezbollah is, uh, is, is kind of the, the talk of the town amongst the Arab street. And so, um, given the fact that Iraq and this is, this is a little geopolitical, but given the fact that Iraq is no longer controlled by a strong uh, a Sunni presence, the Iranian Shiite regime has taken over through Iraq, create, created a corridor through Jordan. Jordan is not a strong country. It is not protecting uh, the border with Israel. And so basically the Iranians have a corridor right into uh, Israel. That part is Judea and Samaria. In order to stop that, we have to strengthen that uh, defense line, that border line, much, we have to secure it much stronger, and, and furthermore, recognize the fact that Iranian, Turkish, and other forces want to stir up the jihad. Uh, that is part of the great strategy of Iran, to have uh, its tentacles uh, in proxies. We see that, of course, in Hezbollah, in Hamas, but now also in Judea and Samaria. They are masters of chess pieces, and they're moving their proxy chess pieces around Israel and endangering it. Uh, the danger towards for, to Israel from the so-called West Bank, Judea and Samaria, is immense because Jerusalem is is right here. Uh, Hebron is a humongous Arab city, and when you let the things go wild, you basically allow for jihadism to create attacks on the rest of Israel, be it, God forbid, suicide bombers, uh, snipers, uh, or even what we've seen in Gaza and in South Lebanon, which is rocketeering. All right. Well, we are out of time, but Yishai Fleischer, as always, pleasure to have you on. Thank you for your insight. Thank you. Rescued in Gaza after 327 days in Hamas captivity, former hostage Farhan Al-Qadi is reportedly in good health after reuniting with family at Soroka Hospital. The IDF has released some details on the rescue operation, but much remains under censorship so as not to harm other potential rescues. The State of Israel also announced the recovery of the body of Sergeant Shaked Dahan, who was murdered on October 7th during the Hamas massacre. His body was rescued from Hamas by IDF forces in Gaza and returned home. May his memory be blessed. More now from Gaza from ILTV's Steve Leibowitz. The IDF has released few details on the rescue of 52-year-old Farhan al-Qadi from Gaza after nearly 11 months in Hamas captivity. The Bedouin father of 11 was found and rescued by naval special forces and the Yahalom Combat Engineering Unit, deep in a tunnel in South Gaza. The operation was based on precise intelligence. The IDF spokesman ended rumors that al-Qadi managed to escape the tunnel and released a video of the first moments after al-Qadi was found. The army did not know the exact location where al-Qadi was, but had intelligence indicating that there could be hostages nearby. They were operating in the area for a number of days before locating the lone captive. We cannot go into many details of this special operation. But I can share that Israeli commandos rescued Qaid Farhan El Qadi from an underground tunnel following accurate intelligence. His medical condition is stable and he will undergo examination in hospital. His family had been waiting 326 days to receive the news they did today. But there are still 108 hostages whose families are still waiting to hear news that their loved ones are home. The Shayat at 13 commandos and Shin Bet agents began to slowly search a tunnel complex in the area where they discovered Al-Qadi. No other hostages or Hamas terrorists were alongside him, and troops did not face any resistance. According to the IDF, Al-Qadi was not in the tunnel for the entire 10 months of captivity and was moved around several times. IDF troops questioned Al-Qadi en route back to Israel in the hopes that he would be able to provide information on other possible hostages in the area. 
The news of Qaid Farhan al Qadi's rescue was met with tears of joy across Israel, across all of Israel's communities. Let's take a look at how Israel and the al Qadi family is responding. Israeli citizen Qaid Farhan al Qadi, a 52 year old Muslim Bedouin father of 11 from Rahat, was kidnapped on October 7th by Hamas terrorists from Kibbutz Magin, where he worked as a security guard. For over 300 days, he was held by Hamas, the majority of time in the tunnels in inhumane conditions. <laughs> During his time in captivity, he not only became a grandfather, but another child of his own was born. After initial medical evaluation, Soroka Hospital reported that Al Qadi is in overall good health. I am happy to inform you that today in the afternoon, we received Mr. Fakhan Al Qadi, a return captive from Hamas tunnels that arrived by helicopter after being released and rescued from captivity. He uh, underwent initial evaluation in our emergency department. He appears to be in general good condition, but will require another day or two of medical tests to make sure he is still okay. Upon news of his release, Israelis of all backgrounds wept in celebration and videos of his family reunification went viral online. <laughs> In Rahat, Al Qadi was given a hero's welcome celebration by the community, and footage from the hospital showed Al Qadi overwhelmed with relief. In a phone call with Israeli President Herzog, Al Qadi expressed gratitude to the IDF and urged the government to bring the hostages home, saying, I'm grateful to the state of Israel, to the army who came. They are doing a sacred duty, risking their lives. People are suffering there. Do everything you can to bring people home. People are really suffering. You can't imagine. Prime Minister Minister Netanyahu also spoke with Al Qadi, who referred to the Prime Minister affectionately as Abu Ya'ir and thanked him for the holy work of bringing him home. The Prime Minister assured Al Qadi that Israel will leave no stone unturned in the effort to liberate the remaining hostages. And for more on the hostages, a delegation of Israeli negotiators is set to arrive in Doha on Wednesday for continued hostage for ceasefire talks. ILTV's Ariel Alakhiani is at Hostage Square in Tel Aviv now with more details. Hi, Emily. So, of course, the whole country is still celebrating the IDF's heroic rescue of a hostage yesterday. However, we must not forget that there are still 104 hostages held by Hamas in Gaza, uh, including 34 bodies confirmed dead by the IDF. Uh, and on Wednesday, a delegation of Israeli negotiators is set to arrive in Doha for continued hostage deal for ceasefire talks. Um, among the delegation are officials of the IDF, Shin Bet and Mossad. And this comes after the most recent Recent talks held in Cairo ended with neither uh, Hamas nor Israel agreeing to many of the compromises presented by U.S., Qatari and Egyptian mediators. Uh, among the points of dispute is that of the Israeli presence in the Philadelphia Corridor, a crucial buffer zone between Gaza and Egypt, which Netanyahu insists requires Israeli presence to prevent uh, Hamas from rearming, while of course Hamas is insisting on the complete withdrawal of uh, Israeli forces from the Gaza Strip. Another area of contention uh, is that Israel would release many Palestinian detainees, uh, among them convicted murderers. However, reports do claim that uh, progress on these points has been made in the last few days, uh, so we hope to see more positive developments uh, in the coming days. After months of pro-Israel artists and authors being banned from venues across the U.S., Americans for Ben-Gurion University will host Jewish reggae and hip-hop artist Matas Yahu at its annual event. You can scan the QR code on the screen to learn more and to register. Matas Yahu, whose concerts were canceled earlier this year due to his support for Israel, will headline the event on September 22nd in New York City. 
Matasyahu and others have pointed out that the protests and cancellations against them are anti-Semitic, as Zionism is a core part of their Jewish identity. Just last week, New York University updated and published its 2024-2025 student code of conduct. The new code for a school that was the site of extensive protests related to the Israel-Hamas war now includes attacks against Zionists and Zionism as a violation of its non-discrimination policies, acknowledging that anti-Zionism is indeed anti-Semitism. The BGU event is fittingly named one day after Matasyahu's popular song. Let's take a look. What is up, everyone? This is Matas Yahoo. On September 22nd, I'm going to be playing a show in support of Americans for Ben Gurion University. Since October 7th, it's really important that people come together. The Jews worldwide need to come together in support of our brothers and sisters in Israel. Uh, Americans for Ben Gurion University is one of the organizations that supports the resilience of Israelis and has helped building to get everybody back on track. God bless you guys. We'll see you on September 22nd. No academic institution in Israel was as deeply impacted by the October 7th attacks as BGU, with students, faculty, and staff among the killed, wounded, kidnapped, and those called to IDF reserve duty. Yet the university is leading the charge in the nation's rebuilding and recovery. BGU CEO Doug Sesserman has said that Matsuyahu's song, One Day, expresses a hope for an end to violence and hate, as well as the start of a new era of peace and understanding. After October 7th, the world needs this message more than ever. To learn more about the event and to register, you can scan the QR code on the screen. The northern border has returned to the daily tit-for-tat exchanges between the IDF and Hezbollah, and Israeli community leaders told the head of the IDF Northern Command they've lost patience with their inability to return home. More from ILTV's Steve Leibowitz. Suspected drone infiltration sirens sounded after an explosive-laden drone crossed into Israeli airspace from Lebanon before impacting near the northern community of Beit Hillel, wounding a soldier. Meanwhile, the IDF said it carried out an airstrike against a building in South Lebanon's Odessa after spotting a cell of Hezbollah operatives there. For northern residents, it's back to the routine of living in an area of Israel turned into a war zone. Earlier in the week, the IDF preemptive strike gave some residents hope that the army would continue an offensive and push Hezbollah out of harm's way. It was a pipe dream. After nearly 11 months of rocket fire, residents of the north mostly remain evacuated, and leaders of the northern communities are furious that the mass preemptive strike by the IDF on Hezbollah targets at the start of the week ended as soon as the threat on Tel Aviv was lifted. The head of the IDF Northern Command, Major General Uri Gordon, met with the heads of the authorities and councils in the north. Following the summer holiday, schools are due to reopen on September 1st. Northern residents who live south of evacuation lines say there are inadequate provisions for the safety of students, especially while traveling to or from school. Well, after more than 10 months of war, there isn't a single Israeli who hasn't been touched by the tragedy of this conflict and the events of October 7th. Joining us today to speak about her experience is Laura Metadi, a former contestant on Israel's Big Brother and the mother of a fallen soldier, Staff Sergeant Nitai Metadi, who recently fell in Gaza. Nitai was on a trip in Australia when the war broke out and heroically dropped everything to fly back to Israel and serve his country, a true hero. Laura, I want to thank you for joining us despite the painful circumstances, and we'd love to hear more about Nitai and his love for Israel. Um, so thank you for allowing me to, to talk about him. Um, he was a he was a special not for that because he was my son. He was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful boy, um, a man. And he had so much love for his country and was so patriotic when he was overseas. He he told me I'm coming back, and we begged him not to come back. And we told him we'll pay for anything. We'll give him a million shekels not to come back and he told me he cannot leave his team and so on and so on. So he came back and he did two months um, in Lewin, and then he, he came out and then he went back. He went to um, France to visit his girlfriend and then he came back to do another trial in Milouim. And um, the last time, he, it was a month ago, he returned from France and um, he said, I'm going in and I said to him, it's enough, you've been eight times already. 
And he said, um, I belong to a unit and we live by the code ride or die. And he died, unfortunately, in the last, the last time he went into Melawim on Friday. How were you informed of this, of this tragedy? And how have you and your family been coping since the news of this, this tragic loss, really for the whole uh, nation, but of course for your family? The information was delayed for me. Uh, uh, my ex-husband knew before and I was away actually doing a tattoo. <laughs> but I had a feeling for a couple of days before I had this feeling that something wasn't right. And I, we had a group for all the parents to write about, to find out how our children were. And that day on Friday, we kept on writing if they heard any news about the kids and everyone told us that no good, no news is good news. And when I returned home with my daughter at five o'clock, the, the army was here waiting for me. And it's a, a sight that I, I don't wish upon anybody, nobody in the world, to see that uniform at their door. And they informed me that Nitai was killed in action. And the only thought that I could think about was maybe it was just he was in a critical condition that at least they'd given me um, time to say goodbye, but they told me he died straight away. He wasn't in pain. He died. He was one of the second or that went into the building on the, and died on impact. Um, to say that everybody around me has been unbelievable. The support from, not from, from people I know, the support from the nation. This is the point that I say that there's no nation in the world that is as strong as Israel. No, people have come from far and wide to be with us, to, to tell us a few words of Nitai. And everybody, he made an impact wherever he went. And the army themselves, as, as if he, even though that I'm angry, the army has been spectacular, <laughs> wonderful. They have given us and to share with us. and. Uh, I am so grateful. Uh, it's in, this, in such a terrible situation, there's so much light and so much love. Well, we are almost out of time, but I wanted to ask you, what do you think is important that those in the international community understand about the IDF and about the tremendous courage of our soldiers, such as Nitai, who've been dealing with this tragic, tragic situation want, in Gaza? I want them to know that all that they hear is so much... They are such a, a, an army of etiquette, and they don't do anything. They try to do as much as possible not to invo involve civilian lives, and they're always thinking of the civilians of, uh, of our enemies. And this is an army of etiquette, and they have got... They, I, I haven't got words to just explain that everybody needs to take an example of how our IDF is, uh, we are a force, and I and I, I only ask them one one thing that we continue, we do not succumb to the evil that we face, so that the next generation doesn't fall like my son did, and that all the children that died before the time, I don't want the time to be another statistic. He was the 698th soldier to fall from the 7th of October. And I don't want him to be another statistic. I want them to go ahead and tell this peace for every mother and father and sister and brother and grandparents in Israel. Well, Lara, I commend you for your courage despite the tragedy. And of course, we here send our condolences to you and your family. A great loss. Thank you for sharing your story, Lara. Thank you very much. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Clear skies are expected around most of the country tonight with lows of around 23 degrees Celsius or 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow we will see mostly sunny skies and hot weather. Expected top temperatures seeing highs of around 30 degrees Celsius or 91 degrees Fahrenheit. That is a wrap for today's news. For the latest updates from Israel on all your devices, be sure to follow our ILTV channel, subscribe to our newsletter, and explore our website, ILTV.tv. Stay informed with all the latest news straight from the heart of Israel. I'm Emily Schrader. Be well, and thank you for watching.